Hello everybody, my name is John Mark Johnson Jr. I am the host of Relationship and Truth and in this video I'm going to be doing another response for Michael. For those of you who don't know, Michael is one of my online friends, one of my online friends that I've had the longest and he often sends me questions that he wants me to interact with, mostly just to get uh, another perspective and another viewpoint on what the, the Bible happens to say about a particular topic. And this time he asked me uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what it means when we say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The reason why this even comes up in the first place is because that word, Son, uh, can have lots of different meanings, and it can have lots of different meanings even in the biblical text. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, for example, if we take a, fray, uh, a verse that happens to mention uh, or refer to Jesus as being the Son of God, like John 134, in which John the Baptist uh, declares that Jesus is the, the Son of God, and we look at the underlying word there, the underlying word in the New Testament is going to be the, the Greek word huios, and huios when you look it up, as far as meanings are concerned, there's a lot of variety. But just looking at the uh, the Freeburg lexicon here, it can uh, literally mean an immediate male offspring, so kind of the typical literal meaning of son. It could be just a simple general descendant, not necessarily an immediate male uh, uh, descendant, but could be a descendant several times removed. It could be uh, it could be used to refer to someone who has been adopted into the family, not a natural born son, but an adopted son. Uh, it could also not only refer to humans, but it could also be used to refer to animals. Uh, as a figurative use, it can refer to a pupil, disciple, follower, or spiritual son. Just reading these off. Um, it can also be a denotation of a relationship. It can be. Um, uh, as saying that someone has a particular characteristic of a uh, particular person or group. Um, there's uh, lots of different ways in which that phrase is used, and I would argue that, that Friburg's doesn't actually include all of the possible uses that are out there, and Friburg's uh, lexicon is meant to be kind of a, a summary lexicon. It's not meant to be exhaustive. Um, but that does give uh, prove the point that there's lots of different ways that that word gets used. And so when we say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, in what sense do we mean? Do we mean in the literal sense? Well, that is how, for example, uh, groups like the Mormons would take it. They would say that Jesus is the literal Son of God, and they would even go so far as to say that we are all literal sons and daughters of God. Um, that's one a way that people go, and that technically that is within uh, the range of possible meanings for the Greek word huios. Uh, there are other groups that would go different ways with it. For example, in the Old Testament, uh, there's a at least one uh, place, but probably uh, several more, where the phrase sons of God uh, doesn't refer to people, but instead it refers specifically uh, to supernatural beings and um, basically what we would call angels. And so there are some groups that would say that when Jesus Christ is called a son of God, that means that he's simply an angel. Uh, there are some Jehovah's Witnesses who might try to argue that way, although I haven't heard too many of them use that particular tack uh, for arguing that Jesus is just simply an angel, but uh, there would be some that would go that way. Um, there's lots of different uh, groups out there that will claim different things when it comes to this whole question of what does it mean when we say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And looking it up simply in a lexicon like we just did in the Freeburg lexicon doesn't really help us a whole lot because the lexicons will say there's a range of meanings. There's a lots of different things that that word could mean. It could refer to a literal son. It's very clear in the Old Testament that that phrase, sons of God, was used to refer to angels. And then there's like at least half a dozen more different definitions that could be applicable. And 
the question very quickly becomes, how do you know which of those definitions is right? The Jehovah's Witnesses have their particular event, the Mormons have their particular bent, and of course, historic Orthodox Christianity uh, has its particular bent on what that phrase, Son of God, means. How do you pick which one is correct? And that is where we get into the subject of hermeneutics and exegesis. Uh, hermeneutics refers to the principles uh, by which we understand the Bible. How is it that we know that we're understanding it correctly? And exegesis is the process of drawing out from the text what the text has to say, instead of accidentally, in some cases, or very intentionally in other cases, um, putting our own spin on things. A lot of times people will get caught up with one particular usage of a word or phrase and wind up interpreting everything that the Bible has to say and indeed a lot of other things in life on the basis of that one particular definition that could apply. The problem though is that it doesn't always. In a text that is as vast and diverse and written over as big a span of time as the Bible, the odds that every single place that happens to mention a particular word is going to be using that word in the exact same way is pretty minimal. Uh, approaching the Bible that way, let alone any significant written document, but especially the Bible in that way, is problematic. It's, um, at the very best, is overly simplistic. At the worst, you're going to wind up missing very key information about what the text is actually trying to tell you if you do that. And so what we need is a way to determine which of these possible sets of meanings is actually correct. And in order to do that, what we need is indicative context. That's one of the principles of hermeneutics for interpreting the Bible that is out there. That is, uh, we should determine the meaning of words uh, based on how they're being used in that particular context right then and there. Um, not how they're being used elsewhere or how they may be used elsewhere. If you want to understand a particular word, you have to understand it in its immediate context. Uh, for example, if I say that my friend's dogs were very hot and they were panting, I'm probably not referring to a food. Uh, but if I uh, say that, um, and if I go on to say uh, that my friend, di friend did indeed have some hot dogs, well, if you take the last part of what I say, it could be kind of confusing for some people that didn't hear the first part of what I say. The part about me giving a little bit more description as to what these hot dogs were, saying that they were capable of panting, probably indicates that I'm talking about some sort of animal. But if all that the person hears is the last part, that he did in fact have some hot dogs, well, there are other things that can be called hot dogs other than canine animals. Uh, we could be talking about food, about processed meat, or about the processed meat once it's put on a bun and covered in mustard. Some of you don't like mustard, and that's your problem, but that's all another story. Um, context determines what of those possible meanings is actually correct, and the context needs to be of a particular sort. It needs to be indicative context. It needs to have markers in it that actually skew it one way or the other that help us differentiate possible meanings. That's what indicative context is. A lot of words will have context to them of one sort or another, but it's not necessarily indicative context. It's not necessarily helpful in telling us one way or the other. So we need context, more than just a little snippet at the end, and it has to be uh, of a sort that will actually tell us what the speaker had in mind when they use this word or phrase. And frankly, a lot of times when the Bible uses the phrase Son of God relative to Jesus, it's not immediately obvious what is in the author's mind. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of passages that are on the table, as it were. Uh, we can only go to those kinds of passages where we actually have that sufficient indicative context. Now, if we were to do a survey of all of the places in the, the Bible that talk about uh, Jesus Christ being the Son of God, we, unfortunately, we would be here for a very long time. And, of course, a good many of those places would not have sufficient indicative context for us to actually say definitively what of all the possible meanings that are out there is actually the one that's being used. Uh, 
Is it being used in the sense of a literal uh, sun? Is it being used in the sense of angelic beings? Is it talking about having a particular nature, having the, the nature of uh, God? Um, is it talking about being a follower of uh, someone, being a follower of God, uh, someone who believes in God? These are all possible meanings that are out there. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go into every single uh, case, although um, that certainly would be relevant. It's just not practical for what we're doing here. We don't have the time. So what I want to do is I want to look at a few very specific places that I do feel have a sufficient indicative context and use those to tell us what the phrase Son of God actually means to the original authors. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. The first place that we're going to look is in what is called the Gospel of Matthew. So we're going to go to Matthew, and we're going to look at chapter 4 and verse 6. This is um, a place. There's actually multiple places in the Bible. That could, uh, uh, there's multiple books that are called Gospels, and this is one of the Gospels. And um, these books uh, generally refer to the temptation of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, before he really gets properly started in his earthly ministry, he's taken out by Satan into the wilderness and he's tempted. Uh, it's kind of a, a first proving ground, if you will. Is this person really fit to be uh, the Messiah? Uh, and, and Satan gives Jesus basically three temptations and one of them is found in verse 6. Uh, and this is Satan speaking, this is the devil speaking. He says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Uh, he's basically tempting Jesus to put his life in peril so that he can prove that he's the Messiah. Uh, Jesus is going to respond to this with a scripture that says, Do not test the Lord your God. Jesus is going to combat the misuse of scripture with the proper use of scripture. Uh, but what is interesting is Satan's understanding of what it means to be the Son of God. Now, obviously, Satan is not going to be a great source of information for us, uh, but we're going to be looking at several people's understanding of uh, the Son of God. We're going to look at Satan's understanding of what that phrase meant. We're going to look at Jesus's understanding of what that uh, phrase meant. And we're also going to look at what that phrase meant to the angel who announced that Jesus was going to be born. Uh, we're going to look at all of them, and I would argue that it turns out that all of them had basically the same understanding of what the phrase Son of God meant. In particular with uh, Satan, He's saying, okay, if you are the Son of God, you should be able to do this because this is written about you. Well, in and of itself, that's not overly indicative. Okay, the Son of God means that you're going to, you know, be held up by God. Um, that God is going to protect you. Well, again, that's not super definitive here. We have Satan quoting this, and what he's doing is he's quoting the Old Testament. We don't really understand what he's talking about here unless we actually know what he's quoting from. And this is where a lot of people are very handicapped when it comes to understanding the Bible. Uh, the Bible, of course, is a very large uh, volume, which is made up of several sub-volumes. And... Uh, the part that is called the New Testament builds on information that was given in what is called the Old Testament. And the New Testament books like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all those ones uh, assume that the person who is reading them is going to have a certain amount of awareness and understanding of what is going on in the Old Testament. So that when people make these kind of slant-wise references, they understand the whole of what's going on. In the modern, though, a lot of people are not very familiar with the Bible in general, uh, but even a lot of Christians are not very familiar with the Old Testament and the Old Testament passages, so a lot of the references are kind of lost on them. Uh, what it turns out that Satan is referring to is found in the book of Psalms, in particular it's in Psalm 91. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Psalm is basically a kind of an archaic word for song. 
Uh, so you could say we're going to the book of the songs, uh, the songs of God's people. And this would be uh, Psalm 91, as we reckon it now. Um, in ages past, of course, they didn't have a, a number designation system like we had. Uh, they would usually either quote the first line or some part of the, the song itself, and that would remind uh, someone of the whole. Uh, they didn't have the handy number system that we have now. That's something that developed over time. Uh, but let's go over to uh, Psalm 91 and take a look at what has over there. And if I remember correctly, this is one of the Davidic Psalms, and a lot of the Davidic Psalms are also Messianic Psalms. And Messianic in this case means it prophesies or speaks of a person um, who uh, would bring fulfillment to what is said here. That is, there's a lot, especially that David said, uh, that was true of himself to a certain extent, but not completely, not fully. Um, there are, and that incompleteness about his own self regarding the situation that he was in uh, was taken as an indication that someone would come along who would completely fulfill whatever it was he was saying. He There was an immediate fulfillment in his own life, but it was never com a complete fulfillment. It was never to its fullest. Uh, so in Psalm 91.9, uh, it says, Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, speaking of this future, future person yet to come who would bring the total fulfillment of the psalm, uh, speaking of this person, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, you dwell in the Lord, the most high, uh, high who is my refuge, the psalmist is speaking, because you made the one that I serve your dwelling place. This is the one in whom you dwell. Uh, because of that, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to, guide, uh, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you uh, strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, there is a sense in which what is spoken here is true of David, uh, the person who is writing uh, the psalm as far as we understand historically. Uh, that is, say, uh, David was someone who was opposed by a great many people in his life, and God very frequently uh, delivered him uh, from those rather bad situations. However, there is a sense of what is said here that is very much so not true of David, at least not completely so. And that is the uh, reason why the Lord is doing this for this person. It says uh, this person is treated this way because he has made the Lord his uh, dwelling place. It says that this person holds fast to me in love. And it says because he knows uh, my name. This is someone who dwells with the Lord uh, implicitly from the, the context we can say properly uh, with the Lord in a way that would please God. Uh, in a way that would satisfy God, in a way that would earn God's uh, commendation. That's not David, at least not fully. There were times when David did what was right. There were times when David had proper motives for things and was in relationship with God, at least to one extent or another, but never completely. David messed up fairly frequently. David messed up uh, regarding uh, an adulterous uh, relationship with a woman named Bathsheba um, that resulted in David killing Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. That was obviously not a case of dwelling with uh, the Lord in true love. You can't say that you truly love the Lord and yet violate his commandments regarding adultery and murder. That doesn't really work. So were there times in Di David's life where he he was doing good, at least as far as external appearances are concerned, yeah. But there's also lots of periods in his life where he obviously wasn't good. This 
typifies David, but only to a certain extent. And the understanding uh, that God's people have had throughout time is that these kinds of psalms, because they could not be completely um, fulfilled in the time that they were writing, that they indicate another who is to come. And so when the, uh, Satan refers back to the psalm, he's referring back to it as speaking of Christ. That is what Satan thought this psalm applied to. Satan thought that this was a psalm that was spoke of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who would be in proper relationship with God, who would um, be loved of God because of the fact that he holds fast uh, to him, uh, because uh, he is the one who is in right uh, relationship uh, with God. He is the one who truly loves God, whereas David loved God, but not in a truly complete sense. Like I said, you can't claim to love God and yet violate his commandments like David did. But of Jesus Christ, it would be true that he loved God truly, completely, fully. He would never violate those commandments. He would never be guilty of adultery. He would never be guilty of murder. He would never be guilty of any violation of the law. What it says in the New Testament uh, regarding Jesus is that um, he knew no sin. Uh, he was truly sinless. That is the understanding of the New Testament authors regarding uh, Jesus. And that seems to be Satan's understanding of Jesus as well. Back over in Matthew 4, 6, like we looked at. Um, Satan takes this psalm that he understands to be about Jesus Christ, and he focuses in on the part that says, okay, since you're this one who's pleasing to God, you should be able to do anything because God is going to guard you. God is going to protect you. Like I said, Jesus responds to that by saying, well, there's a lot more that Bible, the Bible says, and the Bible says, don't test the Lord your God. Um, but, say, but Jesus doesn't deny that this psalm is about him. And he also doesn't deny that the basis on which that psalm is about him is incorrect. The basis upon which that psalm would apply to Christ is that he is the one who fulfills that psalm perfectly. He is the one who truly loves God, who is pleasing to God because his love of God is a perfect and complete love. He is the one who is never going to violate any of God's commandments like David did. That is, Jesus Christ was sinless. That is, Jesus Christ was pure. Jesus Christ was holy. That seems to be the understanding of what made that psalm about Jesus Christ in the mind of Satan. And Jesus doesn't respond to that part at all. Jesus instead says, the problem is with your emphasis on this part about guarding me. Yes, God is going to guard me. God is going to and deliver me. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to go around uh, putting God to the test at every moment that I have the opportunity to. That would be an abuse of what the text says. That's the part that Jesus focuses in on, not the part uh, that references the psalm that is about this holy person that is so holy that it has pleased God to protect them. Like I said, to a certain extent, that's true of David, because David very often did try to walk with the Lord, and David did try to keep God's commandments, but he also failed miserably. Of Jesus, though, it was perfectly true that he truly loved God and kept all of his commandments perfectly. He is the sinless one. So that is Satan regarding Jesus. Satan pulls this psalm out of the Old Testament that is about Jesus, uh, or about the Messiah being perfect, about being perfectly loving towards God, about um, him and being uh, protected and guarded by God because of his perfect love of God. All right, so... That is Jesus responding to Satan, what Satan's understanding was. Let's look at Jesus' response uh, to the high priest. Jesus eventually runs afoul of the religious leaders of the day, and those religious leaders, uh, uh, basically in this case typified by the high priest, um, 
have serious doubts concerning Jesus' claims about himself. And one of the claims that they understand Jesus to be making is that he claims to be the Christ, and more specifically, he claims to be the Son of God. And so this is what they ask him about. In Matthew 26, 63, it says, But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. You have said it. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So Jesus responds to this question, Are you the Christ, the Son of God? With this reference to uh, about this person uh, called the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. We kind of sort of get that in the modern, but like I said before, uh, the New Testament is written with the assumption that people are familiar with the Old Testament and they can, and they know the whole of what is going on there even when parts are referenced. When Jesus references this talk of the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven, he is referencing a book in the Old Testament called Daniel, and he's referencing a particular part of it uh, that we find in chapter 7 of that book. Now, of course, the chapters and verse divisions are a later thing that comes along. We do it for convenience. They wouldn't have referred to it that way. Uh, it simply would have been the content that they had to refer to. So they would have taken, okay, Jesus is talking about this Son of Man who's seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven, and they would have gone to the part of Daniel that talked about that. And it just happens to be what we in the modern put in chapter 7 and verses 13 through 14. Uh, what we use, uh, use those designators for, I mean, the text is what it is, and we put numbers along, but yeah. Uh, that uh, passage is of this prophet named Daniel who um, sees uh, uh, visions and prophecies, and he interprets those visions and pro uh, prophecies. Uh, a lot of people in the modern age nowadays I think that Daniel was prophesying the end of the world and those kinds of things, but it's that doesn't really work with the Bible as a whole because Jesus doesn't see Daniel that way. The New Testament authors don't tend to see Daniel that way. They understand that Daniel was talking not about some future end of the world scenario, uh, but Jesus himself, and I would argue the other New Testament authors as well, understand Daniel as talking about him. It's talking about Jesus, not me, but Jesus. Um, this is what is said in Daniel uh, 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, Daniel is speaking. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, having the appearance of a human being. And he came to the Ancient of Days, which is a name for God, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting and dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So Jesus is asked by the chief priest in his day, is this claim that, what about this claim that you make about yourself, that you're the Christ, that you're the son of God? And Jesus responds by referencing a prophecy of the uh, prophet Daniel uh, that talks about one who is presented before the Ancient of Days and who is given dominion and a kingdom and uh, glory and all these things. And it's said that his kingdom is going to be an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, uh, one that shall not be destroyed. And if you know much about so the Old Testament uh, prophecy and just the Old Testament uh, history as a general rule, uh, one of the themes that comes up in the Old Testament is destruction. Uh, there's lots of destruction that happens in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament claim as to why destruction happens is that it happens to unrighteous, unholy people. It happens to people that are not right. Uh, that is the basis upon which destruction occurs. Sinful people um, deserve punishment. That's, and that's the basic premise. 
And so when you have Daniel saying that there's one whose kingdom is uh, who, one who's coming, whose kingdom is going to be an everlasting uh, kingdom that will not be destroyed, the uh, understanding that people would have had is that the only reason why a kingdom would not be destroyed is because it's a holy kingdom, because it's a righteous kingdom. Unlike all the other kingdoms that the Old Testament talks about that were destroyed, this one is decidedly different. All those kingdoms were destroyed because of the evilness of the wickedness of the people that were in them, and especially those who were leading them. But this kingdom is different. It is led by a very particular person who's going to lead it um, in a way that is not going to result in its destruction, meaning that this person is leading it in righteousness. This person is leading it in holiness. Okay. So we have now the chief priest asking, what about this claim that you're the you're the son of God. And Jesus responds by referencing this uh, prophecy in Daniel that references the one who has the kingdom that will not be destroyed. Basically referencing the holy one that will lead a holy kingdom and therefore because it's a holy kingdom it's not going to be destroyed like all the others. Before that we had Satan referencing this psalm that was about this person who loved God. And it would be fulfilled to a certain extent in the original author in David, but not completely, not fully. The one who fully loved God is the one who obeys his commandments. That would be Jesus. He was the sinless one. Okay. And let's also include the testimony of the angel that told Mary uh, that she was going to uh, give birth uh, to Jesus. Uh, so in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 35, it says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him to the throne of his father David. Sorry, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. We already talked about what it means when a kingdom is not destroyed. It's in contrast to all of the kingdoms that were destroyed in the Old Testament. Verse 34, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. This is an incredibly important statement. This is the angel saying why his name is going to be Jesus, and more specifically, why he is going to be called the Son of God. And the angel, in that immediate context, not talking about other usages of uh, the word son throughout the, uh, the Bible, but in specifically in reference to Jesus and why he is going to be called the Son of God, the attribute that the angel focuses upon is holiness. The child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. That's the association that the angel who announces this makes. So what do we have so far? We have Satan referencing a psalm about someone who would love God perfectly, completely. Someone who would love God to the extent that God would be pleased because of this person's true, pure love in a way that no human being has ever done before or since. You have Jesus responding to the chief priest who has asked him, what about this claim that you're the, the son of God? And Jesus responds by referencing a prophecy about one who would come who would have an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that would not be destroyed like all the other wicked kingdoms that we've seen so far. This would be a holy, righteous one. And then here, the angel specifically not only references the fact that this is going to be someone who's going to have a kingdom that will not have an end, uh, which is what Jesus talked about regarding himself, but he specifically says that the connection between the phrase Son of God and Jesus Christ is the fact that he is holy. That's it. 
these are passages that give us enough context to indicate that has indicative context why that specific phrase is being used. And in Luke 135 here, you don't have much more ind indicative context than this. The other ones we had to go back to other uh, references, other places in the Bible and kind of piece things together is, okay, what's in uh, view here? But this one, out of all the ones that we've looked uh, through so far, is the one that comes out and says it uh, very blatantly. This is why he's being called the Son of God, and it's backed up by those other passages that we already looked at. This one, the angel just comes out and says, this is why he's going to be called the Son of God. It's because he's holy. And this is, in the Bible, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, attribute that God has. In the modern times, we often uh, think about Bible passages that say uh, things like God is love, and it is true, the Bible does say that. God is love, and God is jealous, God is powerful. There's lots of things that the Bible says that God is, and we usually, especially in the modern, we typically focus on just a few of them, uh, very select ones. But what is interesting in the Bible is that because of the, the worldview of the authors, they're uh, a Semitic people writing you know, uh, thousands of years ago, their worldview and the way that they communicate things is, of course, going to be a little bit different. And one of the uh, ways that you can tell when somebody thinks that something is particularly important in this old Semitic worldview is when they repeat things. Jesus, for example, uh, does it when he says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, depending on the translation, or sometimes, amen and amen. Um, when he repeats something like that, it's an attention getter. Uh, and that is that worldview. If you repeat yourself, this is important. And if you not only repeat yourself, but you say it a third time, it is extremely important. For example, when Jesus reinstates Peter, after Ch Peter winds up denying Jesus, when Jesus is about to, Jesus is being called into trial and being hauled off to the leaders of the people and whatnot, uh, Peter and the other apostles, they just kind of skedaddle and Peter beforehand was boasting, oh, no, if yeah, everybody else leaves you, no, I'm not going to leave you. And he winds up doing the ghost thing, too, and um, kind of hangs out in the back shadows going, I, I don't know him. I'm, I'm, I'm just here watching. I'm just the same as you guys. I I don't know. Um, Jesus uh, prophesied that uh, Peter would, in fact, deny him, and that's exactly what Peter did. And... Uh, later on, after Jesus goes to the trial and Jesus is eventually executed and then uh, resurrected, Jesus uh, comes to Peter and he reinstates him. And during this process of reinstating Peter, he asks him, do you love me? And Peter responds one time, yeah, I do. And Jesus asks again, do you love me? And remember, in Semitic culture, repetition is a big deal. And Peter says again, yes, I do. Jesus goes so far as to ask him a third time. And the text actually says that Peter was basically hurt uh, by the, the fact that Jesus said this a third time. The text actually references uh, the fact that the third time was a big deal. And it was a big attention getter. Do you really, truly love me, Peter? That third repetition really driving the point home. That's how, in the biblical worldview, people added emphasis to things, is through repetition. Twice is an attention getter. Three times means this is a really big deal and you need to stop. You need to really think about what you're saying and you better be sure that you really understand what's going on here. Well, it turns out that when it comes to the attributes of God, that issue of repetition comes up. The Bible says lots of things about what God is. God is love. God is powerful. God is a jealous God. There's lots of things that the Bible says that God is. But there's only one thing that I know of that the Bible says in a threefold repetition. Like I said, that's a big thing in Semitic culture. Only one thing that God is... Um, uh, uh, repeated to be in. And that can be found in a couple of places in the Old Testament, and then there's also a place in the New Testament that refers to it. Isaiah 6, 2 through 3. This is, of course, the prophet Isaiah, who is uh, 
uh, recording a vision that he had. And it says, Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, speaking of the seraphim, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Like I said, with the Semitic culture, repetition is a big deal. When Jesus says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, or amen and amen, it's meant to be an attention getter. When Jesus sits Peter down and he asks him three stinking times, do you love me? That's not an attention getter anymore. That's a you really need to get this moment. Well, this is the really need to get this moment about the attributes of God. In the Old Testament, what does it say is the pinnacle attribute of God that mankind needs to be aware of and mankind needs to understand? It's that he is holy. He is holy, holy, holy. And you're not. This is the God you're dealing with. A God who is perfectly just, righteous, who is not wicked, who is pure, in every single way, the one with whom no darkness dwells, the one who is righteous in the fullest sense of the word, that is the attribute of God that gets repeated three times. Not just in the Old Testament, but the New Testament refers to it as well in the book of Revelation, and that's the revelation of Christ um, recorded by uh, the Apostle John. In Revelation 4.8, you have basically a repetition of this vision that Isaiah saw. It gets referenced again in the, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation basically is a recompounding of a bunch of the stuff that is mentioned in the Old Testament and brought together to point to its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Um, again, there's lots of people who think that this is about some future thing. There's lots of people that think that about Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation, that they're all talking about end of days, future events. That wasn't the understanding of the biblical authors. The understanding of the biblical authors and the people that are recorded in the Bible, they understood that it was talking about Jesus. Um, but that could be a whole other discussion for another time. Uh, in Revelation 4.8, it says, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Okay. That is the single attribute of God that is most indicative of who he is relative to us. And so when the New Testament uses this phrase, Son of God, in reference to Jesus, well, the thing that the New Testament authors seem to understand and all the people that they're recording seem to understand about this phrase is that that's the association. I mean, the angel that spoke to Mary, that's exactly what he said. He will be called Holy, the Son of God. Why is he called the Son of God? Because he's holy. When Jesus... Uh, responds to the chief priest who is accusing him of being the son of God, Jesus basically says, yes, and, the, and you are going to see me coming on the clouds of heaven. He's referring to the prophecy of Daniel, in which one was prophesied who would have a kingdom who would never be destroyed. How can you have a kingdom that's never going to be destroyed? The only kingdoms that never get destroyed are holy, righteous kingdoms. What's he saying? He's saying, yes, I'm the holy one. I'm the righteous one. When Satan tries to tempt Christ, he tempts him by referencing a psalm that is about a person who truly loves God. And this person who truly loves God was somewhat indicative of David, but David didn't truly love God in a full and complete sense. David acted in ways that a person who truly loves God would not do. He committed adultery. He committed murder. Um, he was not a particularly um, a good father, etc., uh, etc. Et there were things that David did that were very, very, very messed up. There's no way in which he could be a true fulfillment of that particular psalm of Psalm 91. But Satan understands that that psalm has its fulfillment in the guy he's talking to, this person, Jesus Christ. This psalm is about you. And Jesus never denies that the psalm was about him. 
what Jesus argues is that you're abusing the scripture because you're not taking into account other things that the scripture says elsewhere that you shouldn't tempt the Lord your God. But Jesus never denies that the uh, text is about him. What is the understanding that we keep getting whenever the text specifically references what the phrase Son of God is about? I would argue that when we have enough indicative context, not just context, but indicative context to actually say anything about it, that it's in reference to the holiness of God, which is the one attribute of God that actually bears repetition in Scripture. He is not just holy. He's not just holy and holy. He's the trice or thrice um, holy God. He's the one who is holy, holy, holy. And that is what Jesus is saying basically about himself. And this is what other people, like even Satan, and the angel who announces Jesus' birth are saying about Jesus uh, Christ. That one single attribute of God that is to be emphasized above all others in relationship, uh, in, uh, relationship to God's uh, relationship with mankind, relative to God's uh, relationship with mankind, the attribute that you need to know about God most is holiness. That's why it gets repeated three times in the places, in these places in the Bible, like Isaiah 6, Revelation 4 that we have on the screen here. And when it comes to Jesus, they're saying this is his attribute too. It is saying that this is who he is. He is typified by what most typifies God. Okay, so that is what the phrase Son of God means when we take a look at indicative context. That word son, huios in the Koine Greek, could mean lots of different things depending on the context. It can refer to a biological son. It can refer to angels. It can refer to lots of different things. But when we look at indicative context, it is referring to the one who is holy, and it is borrowing that description from God himself. It is the one who is holy just as the Father is holy. The key attribute that makes God God relative to mankind is what makes Jesus the Son of God. I would not want to push it any further than that or any less than that. That's what the phrase Son of God refers to. Now, as to other questions that will come up, people will ask, okay, so how do you prove, um, speaking from an Orthodox perspective, because we believe that Jesus uh, Christ is the Son of God, but we also believe that he is ontologically God as well. Uh, we understand Son of God as being titular, as being a title, and uh, that it doesn't make God uh, Jesus distinct from God. And frankly, that's a little bit different question and a little bit different discussion. On my video channel here, I have places where I've talked about uh, how do we prove uh, the doctrine of the Trinity and things like that. I'm trying to remember the specific videos. I know one of them was in reference to a Muslim fellow that I interacted with a while back. Um, uh, but there are other videos that I've talked about it as well. And that's a little bit different question. Because uh, you're asking about what Christ is, not what a particular title of Christ refers to. And it's not the same thing, and the, the proofs are not going to be the same thing. The title, Son of God, is not necessarily how we would pr uh, prove from our perspective that Jesus is ontologically God. That's, that, that is what he is. That's a different discussion. But the Son of uh, God uh, is not does not refer to Jesus simply being an angel, although that phrase can be used of angels, and it does not mean that Jesus is biologically uh, the Son of God. No. When we have indicative context, that's not what it refers to. It doesn't refer to uh, biological descent, and it also does not refer to the condition of being an angel. When we have indicative context, what it refers to is holiness, ultimately. Sorry, my stomach is rumbling. Apologize for that. Uh, but hopefully that helps you understand what that phrase means. Okay, uh, Does it prove that Jesus is necessarily ontologically God? No, it's ultimately talking about an attribute of God, which would be related to that, but not the same as. Uh, but what we can say, because of indicative context that is very specific about this being about holiness, that means that it's not talking about 
Jesus simply being an angel or Jesus being biologically descended from God. All right. That is the discussion that I have for you guys. Like I said, there is a whole lot more on this subject and related subjects like the doctrine of the Trinity and things like that that we could go on for a very long time. You don't have the time. I don't have the time, at least not at the moment. Uh, I do have other videos on the doctrine of the Trinity and things like that. And of course, there's nothing to stop you from studying that phrase, Son of God, in more detail. And I would highly encourage you to do so. Um, but thoroughly, completely making sure that you're uh, following good principles of hermeneutics. And be, by the way, good principles of hermeneutics work on everything that you read, not just the Bible. That is, if you would not read, say, your daily newspaper in a particular way, if you would not do that with your daily newspaper or novel or whatever else you're reading, then you probably shouldn't do it with the Bible either. Just saying. Uh, there's lots of other places that you can look for those kinds of things, but hopefully you have a better understanding of what the biblical authors and the and biblical figures meant when they said son of god in reference to jesus specifically thank you all for your time and attention for those of you who are in christ go with god and be blessed and for those of you who are not i pray that you would come to understand the true christ of history the only genuine savior of mankind amen